So welcome back everybody. My name is Paul and I've been making a series about esoteric philosophy and subjects for I've been studying for about 45 years. And a little bit of my background. I'm not saying that everything I say here, I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be absolute right about everything. Of course not. I just want to present some information that I've gathered over a number of years and share it with everybody and my personal understanding of what these words mean and so on and these concepts. I have practiced meditation since my since about 1973 and had a lot of really powerful experiences uh, you know frequently so also met a lot of beautiful people um, and I want to talk a little bit about having various tech kinds of techniques that people can use to kind of help us understand who we are because I'm going to be talking about these types of so-called beings and uh, things that we Hear words, guru, mahatma, yogi, rishi. What are these? What are these words meaning? You know, what what is applied to? And I've always said, well, if we want to, if we want to understand what other beings are, we need to understand who we are, and what the concept of the esoteric philosophy, what what a man is, is really a spirit, and the very that that being, that human, a human being, can take on various forms. This we know from evolution and bones that have been gathered, that there's many different kinds of human beings and different shapes and sizes and colors and so on over the thousands of years. And over the centuries, uh, the, mostly the Hindus and all other parts of the world too, they had concepts about who are these so-called enlightened beings and what's it all about? Who has self-knowledge? And um, the Hindus in particular got into a very, very detailed kind of um, description and the same with the Tibetan Buddhists and so on about various stages and various types of consciousness because they say that we basically have the waking consciousness, the dream consciousness, the deep sleep consciousness, and even deeper state which is the dreamless sleep, um, very very deep union type of consciousness and then there's various combinations and so uh, depending on how this body is purified and cleaned and so on then it can handle certain types of vibrations and so on and different kinds of practices that people do and move their body in certain ways and move their energy in certain ways. Most of these practices, you have to understand that back before TV and all that, the people who would go out in the mountains and they spend their whole life, not only live healthy life and long life compared to most of the population, but they also had very profound experiences and they would enter in a deep state of meditation and just stay in a state of bliss for hours at a time and uh, this is the kind of entertainment basically these yogis did and then people wonder well why did they do that well some of these yogis they went out into the you know they, that was their goal they had a certain vision and a drive within themselves and a thirst to know who they really were so over the thousands of years you know some many of these yogis there's you know in the Hindu tradition there's thousands of them and basically Every being is destined to become more and more expansive, more aware of our own awareness, just more conscious. And, you know, the Hindus and the Buddhists and basically the ancient esoteric teachings say, well, basically this is all about oneness. It's just all one thing. It is all one organism. There's one consciousness. There's one, you know, the delight in the duality so that we can dance and learn and have fun and enjoy different kinds of activities while we're on the process of expanding our consciousness. The problem is that we get stuck. We get stuck not evolving our consciousness and getting attached to all the different pleasures. There's nothing wrong with all the pleasures. We're supposed to have all these senses for a reason. But the problem is that you get stuck, like being in the mud. You know, just the car is spinning wheels and you're not getting anywhere. You just it feels like you're getting somewhere. So a lot of these yogis, these people, uh, went off in the hills and, and mostly a lot of times the hills, they just made, lived an incredibly simple life. So let me go through some of these titles here. Basically the whole idea really, let's just do a little exercise for a minute before we get into this. I often talk about oneness. And it's a very, very easy concept for all of us to understand because intuitively everything I'm saying and everything any teacher has always been just like a mirror that says, okay, stop and reflect 
and let your own inner awareness expand so that you realize, ah, I'm not this body, I'm more than this body. So then that liberates you to understand that wherever you're conscious, whatever you're conscious of, that is a very part of you. And as we, there's training, there's exercises, there's all kinds of procedures that different yogis have developed and they became known as great teachers and they passed down information for a long, and what a great teacher would be something like uh, who would not only has self-realized himself or just herself or whatever, has been able to convey the same kind of experience to many, many other people, you see, because it's not just about an individual who achieves some consciousness and they're the leader and they're the master and they're the teacher and da 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 It's more about expanding all of us expanding together because this is all about service because this is the whole mystery it's a pretty simple thing to grasp actually because just be kind and be kind to other beings and do some service to other beings and you'll start developing some very interesting experiences but a lot of times it's, these simple things are misunderstood and not practiced but let's go through some of these names here basically a guru means a the speller of darkness, the revealer of light. A master just simply means not like a hierarchical master that sits on a throne and says, okay, you everybody just do this and do that. It's sort of just a an expert in this particular area of consciousness, you might say. There's a different kinds of consciousness, there's different responsibilities, and if someone maybe wants to study sound, for example, if someone wants to study light, or someone wants to study energy transfer and feeling. If someone wants to study just a different body and get into the health issues of yoga, I mean, there's all different kinds of gurus and masters. <clears throat> Mahatma just simply means a great soul. A yogi is someone who is yoga's union, so they just uh, united themselves. They basically felt the oneness. They've just gone into a place within themselves and realized my being is has a permeable nature and I can, my awareness can go on beyond the senses and all kinds of subtle understandings and cognitions and realizations that we can have within our own being. And some on some beings that you know practice, there's many, many different stories or thousands of years about all different kinds of siddhas or different techniques and different little miracles. They're not miracles in a real sense, they're just advanced science understanding certain basic things and training the body and mind to um, you know it's very complicated they have books and books and books some of these yogis spent you know lifetimes and they pass their knowledge down again see a monk a sadhu this is someone who's in the process I mean uh, someone who has had a great experience and might be a wandering sadhu in India and go around and teach and so on a bodhisattva is a recurring Realization, basically, the Buddha, you know, a being of that nature, some of this metri of the world teacher, the head of the planet for one particular period of time, uh, they're already been through all the many of these other stages, and they just basically, you know, say, okay, I, I'm, I won't, I, I'm, my commitment is to every being on this planet, and you know, when they're all liberated, when they're all blissful, and everything's good, then I'm, you know, I'm done, my job is done. But this is why, you know people honor them because now how do you know you know if you ever encounter uh, any of these people physically I mean I've met some people I have to say oh <laughs> many people they're just very powerful emanations but there's many different stages now I'd say that someone who you know is uh, doing the biggest work and the most work and they're just liberating hundreds and thousands of people I mean that's those are the kind of people that say well look, I sure can't do that. I, I bet there's some, some very, very great uh, teachers on the planet right now. And in recent decades, it's just been a whole number of them. And because the need is great and the opportunity is great. Because these every single person, every single position or title of any of these names and are just all about service. It's just all about some level of responsibility for teaching and conveying and making sure that every being gets liberated. Now, oneness has an infinite expression, so there's many different types and so on. Now, a polymath is someone who is just a, ma ma um, a genius at many different things. Um, we know from just 
the history, there's just been so many incredible teachers and in the European tradition they didn't really call them, uh, you know, like they might have not called them a Mahatma, they might not call them a Guru. In the Western tradition they might have called them a Master or an Adept or um, <clears throat> an Incarnation. You see, once in a while, see, the, even all these great teachers, all these people, they're all still in deep meditation trying to draw even more bliss and more bliss and more bliss because the whole idea, the more bliss, the more oneness there is, the more bliss there is. So sometimes there's various types of beings that can be drawn into a system, into a solar system or onto a planet and all of a sudden surprise you have some tremendous release of energy. And basically a lot of this is all about just anchoring energy. There's beings that say maybe they work with animals or maybe they work with plants. So there's beings that uh, work with the fire elementals and so on. There's there's all different kinds of ways that a human, that a being, what they call a heavenly man, just like there's a, we are a microcosm, so that you, you use the as above, so below, there's a macrocosm and a microcosm. If you look at the cosmos with that idea of consciousness and conscious evolution and consciousness expansion, then you start to see where you, every, there's a lot of people who listen to these videos that are incarnated and in taking a life on this planet right now who are already well, well, well along on, on the path of, you know, really being a yogi or so on. There, there's many, many, because, the, but they're not awake yet. And I think a lot of people, you know, we read books and we get a lot of concepts and trying to understand, well, look, don't attach these names. These old names have gotten so confused over the years you know, with various kinds of books and misinterpretations and so on, but technically speaking, what they call the Mitria, or the world teacher, there would be one being who would say, okay, for this particular planet, for the next, say, few thousand years, uh, I take responsibility. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach all the other yogis and rishis. They're a Mahatma, if some yogi, they practice a lot, and eventually the Mahatma and Adept are basically based around the same thing. Again, a master is just like... Um, it's not like some of the orders people around like, on a construction site. It's just a various types of uh, station where someone has a responsibility of keeping certain kinds of traditions and teachings alive and so on. Um, now, as far as the, the various kinds of states of consciousness, I'm not getting into detail here. I'm not like an expert. I've had some very, very many, many very profound experiences of meditation, honestly. Um, but I have no way to compare what I experienced with anybody else's experience. So, you know, they have these words of samadhi and nirvana and contemplation and samyana, samyamnama. Back to the oneness. <clears throat> basically, what, it, what we have to do as human beings to be our real self is we don't have to achieve anything. We basically have to let go of what's our not, what's not real within us. And let ourselves come to an inner rest where we realize, okay, I am a formless, I have a formless element that's conscious without all my senses. And that formless element is conscious within the space with me, in the space outward. And I have a little blip of awareness in me. And again, I'm going to reference this, a pulse. With us, you might say a tiny pulse or a tiny little seed of that divine creation, that divine consciousness. You call it divine, it's <laughs> just a word, but that something big, something vast, you know. So this pulse makes a shape. I don't know, a lot of people know about electronics and the wave mechanics and so on. And you would see, like, let's say a bowl of water that was just completely still. And at some point, just like some kind of energy happens and then there's a little pulse. The Hindus, they call that the linga, basically the profound, the first shape, the first cause, the first, like it, something, something starts to rise out of the infinite formless of which we can never, well, we cannot say anything about the infinite formless um, that we just can't know. There's something that we just can't really know, we will never know in this lifetime. So... The first cause, that first pulse that arises in the sea of infinity, in the potential, 
So when people make sounds, man, the, the cosmic sound, the Om, the Aum, Amen, Aman, Ahuman, it's all related to sounds. It's all related to sounds that we can make without even our teeth. We can go, Aum. When those, there's cosmic sound within us going on, and when we start to create a sonic signature in our own body, in our own mind, in our own patterns of our brain, and electrical circuits in our, in our body, we start to synchronize with the rest of the cosmos. And we start to rapidly unfold our own powers, our own awarenesses, and so on. And it's like you have a lot of seeds and you sow them, they all have the same potential for some reason or another. Some seeds sprout earlier and so on. That's just the way it is. But what the purpose of a lot of these teachers, they're all responsible to say, look, you know, we, we're not done here until, until everybody gets happy, basically. <laughs> it takes a really long time. So that's why these teachers keep coming back and back. And although, like I said, there's a lot of people listening to these videos and on many other videos, and there's many other great people out there. There are initiates of various kinds. That's another word I didn't put here, initiate. An initiate, there's a stage of development of consciousness. It can be con unconscious. It's you don't want to attach too many concepts to the idea of an initiation, but basically, these people start to feel a, a more rapid unfoldment of their of their psyche and spirit, and we're waking up, and you know things are getting flowing in our being when we start learning new things. So we're all in this process. And basically, why do people go to? Why do people say worship them? Uh, the Maitreya, the Buddha, Bodhisattva, or the people have never seen a real Buddha or they're worshipping a statue and so on. Well, what happens is these great sages, some of the great ones, the incarnations and the, the real, they, they, they release, when they, when they leave their body, they release a tremendous amount of incredible blessing, you might say, of calmness. In a lot of the places where these great seers have past and left their body, uh, they have built these spires. That's kind of the whole idea of the spire, where because it, there's a, a connection with the cosmos, a literal, physical. All these realizations are not just like, well, they say nice things and they, hey, man, that's profound what you said, you know, you're my guru. No, they, these are the whole purpose of all these teachers and all the labels here is that they, they help everybody do exactly what they've done and even more that's the whole point i mean that <laughs> so we're all destined to become part of this process of becoming a yoga a shaman or whatever and adept and teacher and we have our own particular way and style that's unique to the cosmos and we bring that with all kinds of uh, reverence and we learn from the past teachers and people pray because there's a presence. You see, people understand, well, why do people pray? A lot of people are, ask that question. Probably people pray because they get results. <laughs> Ultimately, there's a part in our heart that's connected to whatever the cosmos is. It's the vast unknown, the thing about which we can, nothing we can be said, the God of infinite infinities, not just infinite, infinite infinities. <laughs> so we're talking about something that we really should talk about. We're talking about a feeling we're talking about an awakening that it can be fast or slow. You can open a door quickly or you can open a tiny little bit of time. You can jump in a pool a toe at a time or you can just jump right in. Be brave, they say, you know, the yogis say, okay, just go after that. Go after, you know, basically the idea is we're born. We don't know where we are in this ladder of consciousness. But the thing is, it's like if you're in an elevator, you get in the elevator and you can go straight up 100 floors if you want. Uh, it, it, you know, as long as you don't get out along the way. <laughs> so part of it is just the commitment that an individual has. Say, I'm so desperate. Usually a lot of people go into meditation and so on because they have experienced the roughness of life, the travel, you know, my goodness. They just say, okay, I've had it up to here. I'm done. Uh, I've seen enough suffering. I want to have joy myself and I want to convey that to others. So, we're all part of it. I invite people to uh, 
you know, participate and read some of the books I've been recommending. I want to just sum it up here a little bit. There's a lot of different co uh, concepts about the word samadhi and some of the other things. I, um, I've read a lot of those. I've experienced, I mean, we're talking about something that really you can't really talk about. Basically, the way to understand what, what a samadhi experience is, is you have to have one. <laughs> and it may not be like something where you have an experience and you say, well, I just had a samadhi. No, it's, it's more like you just feel a lot of joy. And you don't care what the label is. It's just something that <clears throat> a steady stream, you might say, of bliss and joy that is literally intoxicating. So, basically, People practice deeper and deeper samadhi experiences. They try to get stabilized. The whole idea is to get the whole body. See, most people, a lot of people really do not want to go through the effort of cleansing their whole body and eating vegetarian food and doing so many other things, maybe even positions and so on, that you might want if you're really going to get the maximum amount of energy in your body. I mean, I've been around some people. I mean, i tell you what, I mean, literally you faint because the energy is just so, like, You just want to just sit down somewhere and, you know, enter a state, you know. So, basically, it's more of a continuum of consciousness. It's not like a level where you say, I'm on this level, I'm on that level. At some point, you know, you're not even thinking about levels. It's like, what's, what's levels all about? We're aiming at oneness here. We're not aiming at levels. We're not going to, we're not trying to differentiate and chop up everything, the experience of consciousness. That's not where we're going here. We're going to more union, union of consciousness and more expansion, you see. So, <clears throat> basically, in you know, the, the teachings of the esoteric philosophy, they basically said that as consciousness evolves through the universe, the millions that there's so many different kinds of bodies, there's endless kind of bodies and expressions that ultimately even a sun, I mean, a tree has a consciousness. There's a kind of consciousness in a tree and a plant and a, and a bird and an ant. There's tiny little, there's something there. And then what happens when it goes beyond human? I mean, is there, there's a planetary consciousness, the planetary logos, or the Lord of the world, or the, the being that say, okay, you know, you know, I'm Mother Earth, you might say, that like, you know, there's all these billions and trillions and zillions of beings for one, five billion years, they're living on her back, sort of, and it goes to like, but that, that type of being, you might say, a heavenly being or a cosmic being, you might say, their service is to just like they're existing whatever in some state or you know it just like our body provides a lot of opportunity for certain bugs or different kinds of things to live in and so on so it's the same way that we're trying to understand consciousness try it's really kind of hard for people to wrap their minds around but as you look in the mirror another exercise just before i go here is to to understand who we are ourselves. We don't really know much about ourselves, so how can we really make comments? Just this this body, this is this body right here, all of our bodies are incredibly fantastic. It's the body that, that the gods want, you know. So I'll end with one little exercise here. <clears throat> Basically, try to imagine like a room full of mist. And they say the cosmos is an analogy for the cosmos is a just this mist, and in this mist, out of this mist that slowly appears, little things and little forms and little shapes and little wavelets and so on, and then after the time goes by, then eventually ripples, cosmos, swirls, vortexes. If we imagine ourselves as we're in a room with a lot of mist, just imagine that we're in like a soup. Our bodies, we're in a realm of energy. There's heat coming out of us. There's waves of heat. There's sounds. There's our beingness, our whole body, our beingness has breath and a lot more than just the thinking patterns of our mind. So if people do a little exercise like that and just kind of be receptive. And not have a concept about what's supposed to happen, 
how we're supposed to be, what Samadhi is, what this is, what that is. There's no need for the labels. It helps to have a general understanding that, look, there's more to our consciousness than we've been told, and we can have profound, beautiful experiences that are our true natural state. They're not artificial, and that we stand in the world of oneness and in the service with many, many different kinds of beings, some of which have been around for a very, very, very long time, and our soul, the teaching go, is is a reincarnated soul, and we have no idea. Uh, on one level, there is no incarnation, or there's never coming and going. It's just one thing. So a lot of this is just perception, and a big drama that we all get to play in and enjoy and participate, and it's joyful. So I hope that people will enjoy uh, these pieces I'm making, and I'll make some more. Once again, thanks for watching, and be sure to enjoy some quiet time.